Welcome to CS288. This is Module 8. We'll be covering Chapter 9, Network Policy and Access Services in Windows Server 2008. Our objectives will be configuring routing and remote access services in Windows Server 2008, which we'll do in a demonstration. Configure routing in Windows Server 2008, routing support services, describe the network policy server, describe radius servers, and discuss wireless networking with Windows Server 2008. Our RAS, which we commonly call it, is a role service. So you add that as a role service used to configure and manage network routing in Windows Server 2008. It is recommended for use in small networks that require simple routing directions. It's not recommended for large and complex environments. So you can use our RAS to do several things. You can turn your server into a router, which I'll show you here next. Turn into a VPN server, you can turn it into a firewall server uh, that uh, protects you from the outside. Uh, all different uh, things you can do with RRAS. You can also make it into a dial up server so people can dial into your server as well, though that's not as popular as it once was. So if we choose to use our Windows Server 2008 as a router, then we install RRAS and configure it to be a router. And on the left hand side we have a 100.100 .100 network and on the right hand side we have a 200 network. And we can go ahead and set up the router so it routes between these two different subnets. Routing tables are composed of routes. Routes uh, direct data traffic based on the destination information it contains. And the routing tables can be managed in the RS console or from the command line using the route command. So from any computer, it doesn't have to be a server, you can type uh, route print. And you can see up here our IP4 routing information. And down here we've got our IP6 routing information. So if we choose route, we can choose print like we just did. We can also choose route add. We can choose change. So if we've got an existing route we don't want to uh, have that same way, we can change it to be a new route. We can also delete a route. So if we uh, wanted to add a route, we can type route add slash p to make it persistent so that it stays there after a reboot, otherwise it'll be gone. The subnet we want to go to, then mask for subnet mask, and then here's the subnet mask here. And then here's the gateway. The gateway has to be this, an IP address on your network that uh, leads you to the other network. So in this case, it is our router. So our router will lead us to the other network, 192.168.20. So if uh, we wanted to add that route, we could do that at that time. We could also go in and choose to type in route delete. So if we have a route that we don't want anymore, then we can just choose route delete and then it'll get rid of the route that we just added. So uh, that's that's the way to do it through the command line. It's fairly simple and it can be done on any computer. Static routing, which is what we just did, is limited for the following reasons. It requires manual creation and management and should not be used on networks with more than 10 subnets. All affected routers require reconfiguration if the network changes. So static routes are a good way to do it in small networks, but in larger networks you want to use a dynamic routing protocol. Dynamic protocols route traffic based on information they discover about remote networks from other routers. Now, uh, RIP uh, version 2, there's also a RIP version 1, which is kind of outdated. Uh, what it does is it goes out and discovers other routes and does this dynamically instead of typing it in through command line. And you can use RIP version 2 in uh, Windows Server 2008 to automatically discover all of its neighbors. You can also use uh, routing and uh, you know, RRAS, as we talked about earlier, uh, as a DHCP relay agent. So this will relay any DHCP requests from your subnet to the subnet that contains the DHCP server. So it forwards a request unicast, that's one-to-one, -to, -one, to DHCP server giving network ID of the original request. The DHCP server then responds with the appropriate IP address and then relays uh, the agent broadcast response on the original network. So I've had several times where customers have requested that they want to have one DHCP server in one office, but they want the other offices to all look to that one office for its DHCP. And a DHCP relay agent is the way to do that. Network address translation. This allows you to shield your internal IP address 
uh, from other public networks uh, by allowing internal clients to access the internet through a shared IP address. So at your home or office, you may have uh, a single IP address, a public IP address, and your router, your firewall, translates your private to your public IP address. And it does this using port address translation, or PAT. So let's look at an example of that. So here you are, on the, you're an internal client. Your IP address is 192.168.100.100. You don't want everybody on the outside to know that that is your internal IP address. That could be a security issue if someone wants to spoof your address. So what you do is you have your Windows Server 2008 is set up to do network address translation. Its internal IP address is 192.168.100.1. Its outside IP address over here is 1.2.3.4. Is, uh, so then uh, when you go out to a website or another location, they only see the 1234 address. They don't see that you're really coming from 192.168.100.100. So that's what network address translation does. Configuring remote access services in Windows Server 2008. So a couple of different options, uh, again, is dial-up networking and virtual private networks. So dial-up networking allows people to dial into the server. If they have a dial-up modem using analog lines, they will uh, uh, dial a phone number. The phone number will connect to a modem attached to your server, and from there they will gain access to network resources. Uh, virtual private networks is another way. So if you have high speed lines, then you can uh, also set up a virtual private network where it allows any client to connect to your network from any remote location or specific ones if you want to lock it down. Works by creating a secure tunnel for transmitting data packets between two points. So any data that gets transmitted between the client and the server is encrypted. So there's a few different types of VPN that Windows Server 2008 supports. Uh, PPTP and L2TP are the traditional ones that go back to 2003. SSTP is a new one. It uses a port 443 or the secure socket layer to encrypt the traffic. That's the same type of encryption that you would get if you wanted to purchase something online and they use an SSL certificate uh, to encrypt your traffic. So it does support that. It's fairly easy to set up. Um, I think it's a little bit faster. It also works better for newer versions of Windows. So we'll go through that in a little bit. L2TP is sort of old-fashioned. It uses uh, Ike traffic um, using IPsec. This protocol is just blocked by hotels and everybody else who doesn't want this kind of traffic going over the network since it slows them down so much. So you're not going to see a lot of implementations of L2TP. PPTP is still pretty good, point-to-point -point tunneling protocol. Uh, it's not as secure as SSTP, but it is just as fast as SSTP and just as fast to set up. So, uh, but it also has the problem of being blocked at a lot of different hotels and, and other places. Uh, so uh, people are turning to SSTP because there's no way that the hotels would block that traffic since that's the same traffic people use for shopping sites and other things like that. Another new feature in Windows Server 2008 is the Network Policy Server. The NPS is a role service, not a server role, but a role service underneath a server role that provides a framework for creating and enforcing network access policies for client health. From the network policy server, you can configure a RADIUS server, configure a RADIUS proxy, and configure and implement network access protection, which I'll show you here shortly. So what is RADIUS? It is an industry standard protocol that provides centralized authentication, authorization, and accounting for network access devices. Now the key word here is devices. Uh, the devices, not the users. So what you do is, uh, say in a, in a standard VPN type of connection, a client connects to a VPN firewall, for instance. So that is a client to a device. A radius is more of a device to device. So for instance, uh, if you had a wireless access point, you could set it up to be uh, radius linked to uh, your Windows Server 2008 server. So it knows any clients who connect to that wireless access point are going to be allowed to be authenticated because of that radius uh, connection link between the access point and the server. If they don't have that radius link, then anybody that connects into that access point will not be granted access by the server. 
So you have radius clients, which are devices such as wireless access points, network access servers, radius proxies, and radius servers, and a database to contain all the usernames and passwords, not of the users, but usernames and passwords for the devices that connect to it. So you've got a couple different ways to connect here. You've got a dial-in user connects to an RRAS server, a VPN user connects to a VPN server, and a wireless connects to a wireless access point. So there is no radius communication between these client computers and the radius server. The communication is between these uh, RRAS server, VPN server, and access points and the radius server. Once they are authenticated, then the domain controller decides whether or not uh, the users on the left-hand side are uh, authenticated using Active Directory. So two different types of authentication. One is for device and one is for the user. Authentication protocols, 802.1x, developed by the IEEE. The IEEE pretty much uh, brings up all the different standards and ratifies them. Uh, 802 basically just means February of 1980s. That was the first time they got together, and they created all of these standards. So uh, there's lots of different standard, standards we've got here. Uh, one of them is networks. Network access control provides an authentication mechanism to allow or deny network access based on port connection. Standard configuration requires Radius Server as a broker. Supported authentication protocols in Windows Server 2008, uh, there's lots of different ones. There's EEP, extensible authentication. There's PEEP, protected extensible. There is protected PEEP as well, uh, which is uh, version 2. So uh, as the reason why you have all these is as one protocol becomes outdated or maybe even compromised by hackers, they come up with the next version, which is more secure but they still go backwards compatible if you choose to check those boxes. If you don't want to, you don't have to. Categories of EEP are EEP over local area connection or wired and EEP over wireless. This is a very popular protocol that a lot of people use. 802.1x uses a three component model for authenticating access to networks. You've got the client, you've got the authenticator, such as a switch, some device, and then you have the authentication server, the radius server, which is running on the Windows 2008 server. So these are your three points of connection. NAP is a little different, network access protection. This is a new feature. It provides a tool for you to block external and internal network threats. It can be broken into three parts. The health policy validation, the health policy compliance, and then limited access. So I'll actually do a demonstration of that here shortly. All right, so this basically shows the same communication uh, scenario that we saw earlier. Uh, so in summary, you've got RRAS, which is a role service used to configure and manage network routing. Routers, responsible for forwarding packets to uh, process traffic. Routers uses routing tables to determine where to send traffic. Routers use dynamic routing protocols. They can also use static routes instead. Most modern networks support the passing of DHCP broadcast messages between subnets, so that way you can have a DHCP server on one subnet and you can have the requester on another. Demand dial routing allows people to dial into a server, again, not used as much as it was once was, but still available. VPNs allow for encrypted secure traffic from client to server or from network to network using a site-to-site -site tunnel, which we didn't really talk about much, but that's another way to do things. NAT allows you to shield your internal IP address ranges from public networks, and then RADIUS provides authentication for uh, authentication server for network devices to manage client connections. So let's take a look at routing and remote access first. We've opened up routing and remote access from Start Administrative Tools after we've installed the RRAS role service. So once we've got that installed, you'll see that the service is stopped. So let's go ahead and right click and choose to configure and enable routing and remote access. Now we have several options like I talked about during the slide presentation. You can make this a VPN or dial-up server. You can make it a network address translation server to make it into a firewall type of a device. You can choose VPN and NAT if you have more than one network uh, interface card on your server. So it can do both VPN and NATing. And you can choose a secure connection between two private networks. This would be a site-to-site -site VPN tunnel. We're going to choose a custom configuration. 
We want it to just do VPN. That's it. We don't want it to do any of these other things. And we'll go ahead and uh, click OK. And now we've got to start it up. All right, now we're all started. So if we right click on here and choose properties and we go to security, you'll see some of those authentication methods we talked about earlier. So you've got EEP, you've got CHAP, you've got PAP, you've got Ike, uh, all these, these different types. Uh, if you're going to make this an L2TP server, then you can also uh, put in a pre-shared key for that. If you want to make this an SSTP server where it uses SSL certificates, then you choose whichever certificate you want it to secure the uh, particular device. Click on View to see the certificate. And then you click Apply. It's got to restart the services at that point. And then this will now be an SSTP VPN server as well as a PPTP VPN server. No further configuration is necessary for either one of these. On the client side, you just have to create a, a client uh, that connects into a VPN server. And when it says the type of authentication, you choose either the point-to-point -point tunneling or you choose the secure socket or SSTP connection. All right, if we open up the network policy server, now we're going to see some different things here. So on the bottom part, on the left-hand side, we see network access protection. So this is where we can have these system health validators that we can use to make sure that a computer has certain features turned on before we allow them to join the network. So if we want, we can go ahead and look at the default configuration to see how that's set up, and we can check or uncheck various different things. So for instance, on a Windows 7 or Vista, or Windows XP, we have different settings. So let's just say on the Windows 7 one for now, uh, in order to connect to this network before we will allow you in, you have to have a firewall turned on. So it could be a Windows firewall or a third party, doesn't matter. Got to have uh, an antivirus application and it's got to be up to date. You can have an anti-spyware application and it knows about all the different ones that are on the market and it has to be up to date. And you can have, it must have automatic updating enabled as well. So you can also redirect, um, restrict access uh, to clients who do not have these uh, all these different features, and you can send them off to another server that allows that gives them the ability to update before it allows them onto the network, or you can just flat out reject them. So if you leave all those checked, then all those different things will be uh, checked out on those computers before they're allowed in. So here's the health policies. And in the health policy itself, you can add in the policy that we had earlier. And so we can choose new, uh, we can choose uh, type in anything we want here, and we can choose that default configuration, which I just showed you. And then now it won't let anybody else in uh, that doesn't have those particular features turned on. Network access policies, uh, these are also um, some default policies that get created. We can go in and we can enforce NAP. We can do some other things, put in some filters, make sure there's encryption, you know, all those kinds of things. This is for, these are conditions for our RAS, for Microsoft uh, Remote Access Server. So these are for the VPN people. The other settings uh, under health policies, that was if anybody connects through the LAN. This one is only if they connect uh, through VPN. And we can go in and we can say, uh, if they meet or do not meet all these things, we can either grant access or deny access, up to us. So that gives you a little bit of an idea about uh, network policy servers and creating VPN servers and uh, some other things that we talked about with routing. And if you have any other questions, you know how to reach me. And that concludes our Module 8 discussion.